Hi, in this particular video we're going to look at the AQA paper and it's actually from Thursday the 24th of May 2018, so it's actually June 2018 uh, where most of these papers were being sat. Uh, this particular one is the non-calculator paper and my aim is we're going to work through this for about the next 20-25 minutes, answer as many questions as we can within that time but please do stop and start the video, have a go at each of the questions for yourself and see how you get on. Okay let's have a look then at question number one. So this is very typical with AQA, you tend to get these uh, multi-choice type questions right at the very beginning. So the first one is, is we've got uh, 64 times a thousand and we've got the cube root of each of those well actually um, it's much easier if you work out the cube root of 64 which is actually 4 and then the cube root of a thousand which is actually 10 so 4 times 10 is going to be 40 and that would be the answer to the first question okay next one is on to a vector Okay, so what you've got with the vector is it translates minus 2, 3. So what it means is, is that if you have a vector here, so it's starting at A, and it's going to work um, minus 2, so it's minus 2 in that direction, and then it's actually going to go 3 um, upwards to 3, and it's going to end up here. So it's going to go from A to B. So therefore we need to translate or circle a vector that translates B to A. So we're going to go back again. So we're going to go, in this particular case now, we're going to go along 2. We're going to be very careful with this because always we, we go along the corridor and then down the stairs. So we're going to go along 2 and down 3. So the answer to this particular question is going to be that one there. Okay, circle expression that is the equivalent to this. Um, okay, so the thing about this is you need to remember bid mass. So we're going to be doing the multiplication first. So we've got a times 4a. Well, that little bit in the middle there is going to be 4a squared. Okay, and then you've got 3a plus 2a. So that's going to be 5a um, minus 4a squared. Okay, so minus 4a squared. So it's actually going to be this one here. Okay, I hope those three questions have been okay for you. Let's move on then to question number four. Okay, question number four. We've got a circle of numbers which are closest in value to this particular question. It's one of those um, kind of estimate type questions. Well, let's have a look at that. So what we can say is the top is actually really, really close to 10 and the bottom is really, really close to 0 0.02. Okay, it's really hard to do that type of calculation. So the best way to do it is to make sure the bottom number is a whole number. Now at the moment, in order to achieve that, I can move the decimal point two places and make the bottom number 2, which makes it much easier for me. Okay, if I do it exactly the same principle with the top, I'm going to move that two places, so it was here, and then he's put a couple of zeros on there, so that's going to become 1,000 divided by 2, so the answer to this particular question will be 50. Okay, on to question number 5. So in question number five, we've got a bracketed term and it's an inequality. So we just need to really treat it much like a linear equation. So we're just going to solve it in much the same sort of way. If we expand first the brackets, I'm going to get 5x plus 15 is less than 60. OK, what I'm going to do then is I'm going to take 15 away from both sides. So I end up with 5x is less than 45. And then I'm going to divide through by 5. So I'm going to get x is less than 9. And you'll note that the inequality sign stays the same way around with this particular type of calculation um, all the way through. So the answer to the question will be x is less than 9. 
odd occasions you're going to be asked to actually put that onto a number line as well so just be aware these questions can sometimes ask you to draw the inequality as well okay let's move on then to question number six uh, question number six is one of those questions where you just need to make sure that you read it and you understand what they're talking about so the height of Zach is 1.86 the height of Fred is 1.6 write the height of Zach as a fraction of the height of Fred <laughs> okay so what we mean is it's actually a top heavy fraction the height of Zach is going to be on the top and the height of Fred is going to be the denominator, which is 1.6. All right, not a fantastic fraction because obviously you're mixing up there with decimals. So let's make it into a nice looking fraction. So that I'm going to just multiply by 100 and move the decimal point two places. Um, both top and bottom. Um, I could also, if I wanted to, just reduce this down a little bit so it becomes 93 over 80. And actually, you know, for three marks, that is actually the answer to this particular question. So it's a bit of a giveaway. I actually thought that you might need to just change it into some sort of mixed number, but it does ask for the answer in the simplest form. I guess you could write it as one and 13 over 80 if you wanted to, but actually this is the full answer for this particular question. Okay, let's move on then to question number seven. We're about six minutes into the video. So, okay, so on to question number seven. It says A, B and C and D are points on a straight line and the coordinate of A is zero to etc. And we're going to work out the coordinates of D. Okay, so before I do that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a bit more information onto the graph just to make sure that I can read a little bit more correctly the uh, coordinates. So this particular one is A, so it means this point here is zero, and I know it says zero, but I'm going to put it in anyway, and this point here is two, so it's zero on the x-axis and two on the y-axis. Same with B, so if I just uh, come down from here, this point here is going to be six, and this point across here is going to be five. And what I'm doing is I'm sort of building up a little bit of a picture now of the way that these coordinates are working. Okay, now part of my question is, is this that AB equals BC? So in other words, this distance here, AB, is exactly the same as this distance here, BC. So it actually follows that the jump in, across here is going to be the same as the jump across to here because this distance is going to be the same as this distance to C. So if you like what I can do is I can put that down like that and put the number 12 along there. Okay, which also then follows that if there's a jump of 3 from 2 to 5 there's also going to be a jump of 3 from 5 to this point here which is going to be the y coordinate for c which is going to be 8. Okay so hopefully you can see how that's been built up and then it needs to work out the coordinates of d and we're going to do exactly the same. Okay so in other words we're going to jump another six places along here to 18 so that will be six places along here okay and then another three places along here so that's going to be 11 so the coordinate of d is going to be 18 11. okay hope that answers that question sometimes you just need to really read the question and just make sure that you've got it exactly right okay so let's have a look then at question number eight and this is a coin is thrown 50 times and it lands on tails 31 times. Write down the relative frequency that it lands on heads. Okay, well the relative frequency is just basically the probability of it landing on heads, which is going to be 31 out of 50. Okay, and if I want, I can change that to a decimal. So if I multiply that by 2, it's going to be 62. Multiply that by 2, it's going to be 100. So actually, it'd be 62 over 100, which is the same as saying 0 0.62. 
Okay, Ryan says, no, beg your pardon, Ra says that the coin is biased towards heads. Use the data to give a reason why he might be correct. Well, he might be correct indeed, because you would expect, so he is correct, um, as you would expect, rather than it being 31 out of 50, you would expect 25 out of 50 or 0.5. And that kind of would be good enough for you to be able to get that mark. What you're basically saying is that um, it probably is biased towards heads because it's landing on heads a bit more frequently than it's landing on tails according to the information that we've got. Okay, so let's have a look then at question number nine. So with question number nine, we've got um, a range of a set of numbers is 15 and a quarter. The smallest number is minus two and seven eighths. Work out the largest number. All right, so just be really careful about this one. I think the way you can do it really is to actually just construct yourself a number line because um, it's it can be just a little bit tricky to kind of get these sort of um, sorted out in your own mind. So what we've got is we've got a point here which is minus two and seven eighths and then we're going to go along the number line okay and at that point here let's say this is going to be zero okay and then we've got a range of 15 and a quarter so what we're saying is the difference between here and the end is going to be 15 and one quarter. So hopefully you can see that if we're going to work out the largest number, which is this number here, then we have to take that away from 15 and a quarter because we're actually trying to work out this um, this number line over here. Okay, so I'm going to work that out as 15 and a quarter minus two and seven eighths. Now the immediate problem is that when you're sub, uh, subtracting fractions, you need to make sure you've got a common denominator. So I'm gonna make those both eight. I'm actually gonna write that as 15 and two eighths minus two and seven eighths. Now there's a couple of ways you can do this. What a lot of people will do is they'll convert those to top heavy fractions and go through a whole bunch of calculations to actually get to the final answer. I'm gonna do it my way and the way I do it is I'm gonna rewrite this 15 two eighths to 14 and 10 eighths. Because if you can imagine this 15 is the same as saying 14 and 8 eighths. So just that 15, I could write that as 14 and 8 eighths. And then I've got this 2 eighths that I need to add on to it. So I can write this fraction as 14 and 10 over 8. And then I've got minus 2 and 7 eighths, so it's much, much easier for me to do that calculation. I appreciate I've got a whole number and a top every fraction there, but hopefully you can see that this and this are exactly the same. But what it allows me to do is to say 14 take away 2, well that's going to be 12. And then uh, 10 over 8 minus 7 over 8, well that's going to be 3 over 8. And whichever method you choose to adopt with this type of calculation, not a problem at all. If you choose to do top heavy fractions and, and that sort of thing, that's perfectly fine. But hopefully you'll come up with the final answer. Okay, so we'll just finish off this particular section with question number 10. And it says y is inversely proportional to x. So what we're actually saying is that y is inversely proportional to x, okay? So be very careful when you read this. They do tend to interchange them between directly and inversely. Uh, inversely. What we've got here then is um, the makings of a formula. This is just a relationship. Y is proportional to the inverse of x. So if we want to make that into a formula, we would write that as y equals k over x. And this value of k is called the constant, and it's the bit that we need to find in order to answer these questions. Now, the bit of information we've got for x and y is going to be this one here. And what we're saying is, is that when x equals 6, y equals 4. So I could write this as... 4 equals k over 6. 
and then just by multiplying both sides by 6 I can work out that k equals 24. So now at long last I have my formula, my proper formula that I can just plug the numbers in and the formula I'm going to use is y equals 24 over x so rather than writing k I'm going to write or this constant I'm going to write 24. So if I do that if I know that x is 12 24 divided by 12 is going to be 2 so y must equal 2 and similarly with uh, uh, the value of x here if I know that y is 8 then 8 is the same as 24 divided by 3. So in this particular case, x will equal 3. OK, I hope that's OK for you. That's going to be the end of this particular video. It's probably run to about, um, about 20 minutes, uh, 25 minutes or so. Um, and uh, please do have a look at the video. See what you think. I'm going to be um, doing the rest of this uh, uh, video or the rest of this paper in another couple of videos and I look forward to seeing you inside the next video.